I do a lot of different things for the tour project. Um, the tour project is a U.S. nonprofit. Um, has been that since 2006, and it's a very flat organization, meaning that you can take on pretty much any role that you want to have. So I've tried development, research, uh, project management, community management, support assistant, a lot of different types of roles, which means that when you get the chance to do that, you learn a lot about different things about the project, the different users, um, and you get to interact with and talk to a lot of different people. So I've worked for, for and with the Tor Project since Google Summer Code in 2009. Um, we still do Google Summer Code, and there's still a lot of people that kind of join us and help out. We're now around somewhere between 20 and 30 developers uh, from all over the world, so US, Europe, and, and Asia as well. So Ian mentioned that there's a lot of things that have changed in the way online anonymity tools, I guess, in the way they're used and also in the way they're blocked and attacked with the Arab Spring. And what I want to talk about is the blocking events um, that happened before the Arab Spring, how Tor was blocked in 2006 and 2000, or, or from 2006 and, um, until 2009, and then compare that to what we've seen since the beginning of 2011. So I guess most people remember how the Arab Spring started, December 2010, a man in Tunisia decides to set himself on fire in protest of uh, police corruption and ill treatment. He later dies in hospital. Uh, a protest around the time of his funeral um, just spread throughout Tunisia and then on to other countries in the region. Um, <coughs> and I don't know if it's, I guess, right to talk about like an end to the Arab Spring at this point, since a lot of countries are still, I guess, struggling. There are a lot of people in a lot of countries still fighting for freedom, in a way. But we'll talk about, I guess, um, before being up until December 2010, and then after, um, I guess, end of 2011, I guess we can say it. So who's heard about Tor? Who's used it and know how it works? Okay. So Tor is a uh, piece of software, a program that you can download onto your computer. Uh, you don't have to install it, it will just work. That gives you a browser that allows you to browse the internet anonymously. It means that no one can see which websites you're visiting. No one can see what you're searching for on Google. If you have a Gmail account and you're logged in and you also search for something on Google, Google will not be able to link those two. They will not be able to link what you view on YouTube with what you have in your inbox with what you search online. And it's being used by a lot of different people for a lot of different purposes. Um, anything from, from military and law enforcement that want to do sting operations, for example, to journalists, activists, whistleblowers, normal people use TOR. Um, we have worked with uh, survivors of domestic abuse in the U.S. and they need TOR to, I guess, stay hidden in a way. So there's a lot of different types of people that, that use this tool. It's not just for activists. So this is a very um, simplified image of how TOR works. The idea is that your, your data will be sent through three random servers somewhere in the world. Most of them are in the US or somewhere in Europe, um, but I do believe we have some in Tokyo as well. Um, so your data will be wrapped in three layers of encryption. Each layer has a different session key, depending on, so you have your, you have your data and then it's sent to the first hop. So when it reaches the first hop, it will have three layers 
of encryption on top of it. So the first hop will peel off the first layer and see that it's, it will only be able to see that it's going on, that it has to send the data on to the second hop. So it will send the data on to the second hop. The second hop will peel off the second layer and see, OK, so it came from the first hop. So I'm the metal hop, and I have to pass it on to this third hop. So it does that. Third hop peels off the final layer and gets to see where the data is going, if it's Google or Amazon or Twitter or Facebook. So no single hop will be able to connect who's searching for what, who's visiting Facebook, who's logging on to Twitter. It will only know a piece of the information, but not enough to de-anonymize the user. So far, so good. So Tor started as a uh, Naval Research Lab project. It's a US government project to, be, to begin with. Um, and the idea was that they wanted to protect government communications data. So when the code was released in 2004 and a paper was published two years later, the idea was that Tor would be an anonymity tool. It would be for the purpose of protecting sensitive information so that no one can link a PDF or some piece of information to whoever sent it to begin with. No one thought about the fact that Tor, it later turned out, uh, could also be used for circumvention, for censorship, like anti-censorship, that a lot of users in China would be using this just to reach Twitter, Facebook, and BBC. Um, so, with that came a bit of an arms race when a lot of different countries then realized that, hey, a lot of users are using this tool to reach websites that we have blocked. We don't want them to use this tool. So they try to find different ways to block it. Um, the most standard one, like Thailand did, is just block the website. If you can't get to our website, then you can't get the software. At least that was the case back in 2006. We now have ways that you can, you can get the software via email. If you email us, then we'll send you the package back. We also have mirrors so that even if torproject.org is blocked, you can just email us and we'll send you a list of 10 other sites that you can go visit and you can download the software anyways. And there's also a lot of um, different ways that, that people pass it around, like on a USB stick and you'll go meet up with your friends in a coffee shop or something like that and you'll pass the USB stick around and then everyone will have this tool. Um, in, also in 2006, Smart Filter and WebSense um, found a way to block Tor by cutting all HTTP GET requests. So when, when, when you first start Tor, it needs to somehow download all the information about all the servers in the network. So to find out which three it's going to use when sending the data through the network, it needs to download a list of all of them, and then it will just pick three by random. But if it can't download the list, then it can't connect to the network because it doesn't know which relays there are. Um, so they just blocked anything that is an HTTP request for slash tour slash. And they advertised this. And Iran, Saudi Arabia, a number of other countries bought into this. And it worked for a while. Um, the solution after was to use switch to um, TLS, SSL, when downloading this info so that, sure, you can block HTTP GET requests. There's a different way of getting it. So Tor magically worked again. Um, until Iran decided to start throttling SSL traffic, which meant that well, throttle, and at some point they also blocked it completely, so that if you can't get to, if you can't do like an encrypted connection to get the information about the relays, you can't connect to the network. So now we're doing uh, TLS on port 80 as well, on one of the servers. Um, at one point, we also made Tor to look just like Firefox and Apache, so that Tor traffic would just look like standard encrypted web traffic. So when they started throttling SSL, they got Tor for free. Um, in Tunisia, they blocked all, both port 80 and 443. 
And in some cases, if you're extra special, they would block port 443 just for you. Um, which meant that a lot of this, like, so you would get the information about the relays, about the servers in the network, but they don't necessarily run on 80 or 443. They run on like 9001, 9030, whatever random port you want to set it to. Um, there are now, you can tell Tor to specifically only try port 80 and port 443 when connecting so that you don't run into this problem. Um, in 2009, China started blocking all the public relays. So when your Tor client starts up, connects, it will download all the information. That meant that China could also have all this information and anyone who wants to block Tor can block all the IP addresses in that list, which meant that if they're blocked, you can't connect. And so that's when we created uh, Bridges, which is, it's, it's a type of, um, relay or like a type of server, it will replace, it will act as the first hop, but it's not, the IP address is not publicly listed on any website. So you need to learn about it to use it, and you also need to learn about it to actually block it first, um, which is what China did. Uh, we have, there's a, um, a site on bridges.torproject.org. If you go there, you get three IP addresses that you can use to connect. Um, and they just kind of kept pulling that page and got all of the IP addresses in that one bucket. Um, but we have like four or five. So they thought that they had all of them. They didn't. They later learned about um, bridges at torproject.org. If you email that address, you also get three IP addresses, which are not the same set as on the website. Um, so they got like a second set at that point. So the, so Tor's been running since, well, I'd say 2002, that's when the code was released. Um, the earliest point that we actually have fancy graphs from is October 2009. At that point, we had around 200,000, 300,000 daily users from all over the world. And then the Arab Spring happened and a whole lot of people started using social media to kind of uh, organize protests, um, keep in touch with each other. The world would kind of, like everyone else, I would sit on Twitter and follow like the right hashtags to see what was going on, see if anyone needed help with tours, see if anyone needed a bridge and things like that. Um, and it worked great for a lot of people. They used kind of Facebook to kind of create pages for protests or, um, or pages where they kind of requested help or servers or something like that. And it, it worked until these websites started to be censored, which is what happened in, in Egypt. Um, on, see, on January 26th, that's, that's when Egypt decided to block both Facebook and Twitter. And that's when you see the first spike there. That's when everyone saw that Twitter and Facebook were blocked, but if you have Tor, you can, you can get around it. So everyone went and downloaded Tor and started using that. Uh, and a couple of days later, uh, the government kind of realized that people are still getting around the block. They're still on Twitter, they're still on Facebook, and so they decided to just pull the plug completely. But what's, what's also interesting on this graph is like October 2010, we had, what, 800 daily users? And then July 2011, more like 1,500 users. So it's kind of worth their mouth. The second, like, and this is the case with, with any type of tool. The second it kind of gets some media attention and people learn that this is something that actually does work, people start using it. Was anyone here at Hope this year? Hackers on Planet Earth is a, uh, conference in, in New York every other year. Um, and there was this great talk this year by Griffin Boyce about information distribution in the Arab Spring. So Tor is great when you have internet access, but you need to, like you either wanna be anonymous or you, or you wanna reach a different website. If you don't have that, then you can't really use Tor. So this talk, Griffin's talk, covered a lot of kind of other 
methods that people would get the word out. So shortwave, pirate radio, um, a few ISPs slash telecomics and anonymous set up dial-up services for people in Egypt and other countries. Uh, you had services like Speak to Tweet. There were people that would, outside of these countries, that would call people they know or even just call random numbers and talk to them and get their stories and then tweet about it and blog about it. Uh, people used Bluetooth local networks to kind of share and spread uh, videos. So if, if I'm sitting on a video and I can't get internet access, then I can't spread that. If we all set up a Bluetooth local network and I share it with all of you, sooner or later, at least one of you will have access to the internet. I can actually upload it to YouTube or post it on Twitter or whatever. And that, that turned out to be really, really, really effective. Um, so people started learning about Tor. Um, people started learning about free proxies, about VPN services, about RetroShare, about all these other ways that technology would help them get the word out and connect to these websites. So this is a graph of directly connecting users from all over the world. And just look at the spike in like around April 2011. We went from like 200,000 users to more like 300,000 users, 400,000 users. People know that this is a tool that actually works. It's safe. It's been around for a long time. So it's not like Haystack, which turns out not to be uh, anonymous at all. And it's completely open source. There are papers. There are a lot of people reading our code and keeping an eye on it. So if we did introduce a backdoor at some point, people would notice. And I think that's, that's one of the reasons that Tor got so, so popular is because it does work. And it does, it kind of has been, I would, like we can't guarantee that you're anonymous at all times because guarantee is a really, really strong word. But we do our best to make sure that that is actually the case. So between 2010 and 2012, um, we had an increase uh, in the number of users in Tunisia and in, in Egypt. Um, but what happened in Syria and in Iran, I mean, we went from like 600 to 15,000 users in just probably around like four or five months, from 7,000 to 40,000. What happened later in See, September 2011, we had, uh, we teamed up with, I believe it was Voice of America and the Persian News Network, and we advertised Tor to millions of users. At that point, that was when I started doing more support for Tor, and we got hundreds of emails every single day from people who wanted this software and wanted to know how to use it. And all countries, from around 200,000 to around like somewhere between 400,000 and 500,000 users every day from all, from all over the world. And to kind of put that into comparison, the servers that we have, they're around 3,000. So we have 500,000 users every day using three out of those 3,000 servers. So that also kind of explains why Tor is a bit slow for, for, for anyone who's actually tried it. It can be slower than your normal connection. Um, and the fact that so you're sending your traffic through a server that might be in for like from here to Germany, to the US, to Tokyo. So not only is, is it like the distance a problem, but the load on each server as it takes a whole lot of traffic from a whole lot of users constantly is also a bit of a challenge. Um, so the way we're trying to deal with that problem now is we got funding to sp specifically for setting up exit relays, fast exit relays, the last hop that you use. So what happened when Egypt decided to pull the plug because they saw that just blocking websites wasn't effective enough and people were still getting messages out. They were still organizing protests. They were still getting, getting things done. Um, I think a lot of 
people then realize that if you do want to block Tor, if you do want to actually prevent people from doing these things, you need to do more than just block the website or throttle SSL or block everything but port 80 and 443. So a lot of these countries are now using deep packet inspection and we're also seeing that being used in Europe in some cases. Um, the first item there is also an interesting one. Who heard about the DJ Notar and Komodo incident? One, a couple of people. So DJ Notar was, I don't know how big they were, but it was a certificate authority they could issue SSL certificates. So if you have a website and you're using, um, you have, you're using SSL, I guess. Um, so you'd need a certificate for it normally. You can either create one yourself um, that's not too pretty or you can buy one. You can have this like authority telling uh, people who visit your website that your website is safe to use and it has been kind of, I guess. I don't know what the requirements are and how closely people look at your site. I don't think about the safety, the, the Probably not. the site itself. No. no. Mm. Like, they have that new contract now, these baseline requirements in these CAT forum. Uh, yeah, okay. NTCAs have pulled out last week. Okay, yeah, so I, I guess it depends on the company that you buy your SSL certificate from. Some are, some are better than others. What happened with DigiNotar and then I guess, so this was, DigiNotar was around April 2011 and Komodo happened a couple of months later, was that they had incorrectly issued certificates for our website to a malicious third party. We believe that this party was in Iran. Um, there was someone posting as Komodo something on Pastebin talking about this attack um, and kept doing so for, for a few weeks, I think. Um, then the use of the packet inspection. China was, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they used it way before 2011 uh, but they're, so they're now using deep packet inspection to identify tour traffic. And then they will also, like um, Philip Winter uh, in, in Sweden, notice he wrote a really good paper about how China is blocking <laughs> tour. Uh, and where he also talks about, he, he, so he was seeing connections from within China to the university in Stockholm. Legitimate connections. So a user is connecting with SSH or logs on to a website. And then like within like a couple of minutes after, there are connections from random Chinese IP addresses connecting and just sending some garbage data just to see what this is. And if it's Tor, they block it. Um, so China has now, since then, uh, managed to block, they block all the relays, they block all the bridges. The second you set up a private bridge, one that you have never told anyone about, and a user from China connects, that is blocked within like 10 minutes. In so we know what, <coughs> what do you deduce from that? That whatever the Chinese are using are capable of profiling tour traffic within 10 minutes? Yeah, with yeah. like, so, so they look at, um, so they have some fancy way of fingerprinting tour traffic, and then they will also actually check the connection. If they believe it's tour, they will set up a tour connection and check. And how long do you think they've been able to do that? A couple of years now? Or? Well, we know that, so this was seen, uh, 20, like beginning of 2011, probably towards the end of 2010, uh, probably even before that, and it just took a while for us to notice. Uh, and I think the, the way um, someone first picked up on it was these connections to the, the university in Stockholm. Right. So it wasn't directly related to Tor, it just kind of looked weird. And then the question then became, does this apply to connections to Tor as well? Uh, didn't you check the actually? Uh, I think Tor actually changed all SSL parameters at some point, so it looked like the most inconspicuous traffic possible. September 2011, when uh, uh, so I ran. How do they still fingerprint? Um, I'll I'll get back to that in a all second. Right. Um, so September 2011, I ran started using the packet inspection. Uh, they had two ways to fingerprint tour traffic. One was that in the Diffie-Hellman, I guess, handshake, there's a parameter that we use, or we used. We followed the RFC for this and chose, 
like a prime from that RFC, which it turns out that no one else is using. So they just fingerprinted us on that. Any connection kind of <coughs> doing that would be blocked. Um, so we managed to detect it. We issued a fix. And within 24 hours, people were back online. Um, so I think a couple of weeks later, they tried again. They found another fingerprint to block us on. They did that. We issued a fix. And users were back online in 24 hours. Um, and then nothing really happened until Valentine's Day in February, when we all of a sudden we get hundreds of emails from people in Iran saying Tor does not work, Twitter does not work, Gmail does not work. What is going on? And it turned out that they had just put on like a general SSL block. Any type of encrypted connection was blocked in Iran, which probably must have hurt kind of banking and any type of online uh, website using SSL was not accessible from within Iran. Um, so this went on for, for like a couple of days and then I think they removed that block now or they may be like throttling it still. I'm not entirely sure what the status is, but um, they didn't completely block it forever at least. I don't, they, they, they lifted the block at some point. Um, and then came the whole discussion about the halal internet, that Iran wanted to just cut off the normal internet and create their own. Um, what then happened was, I think it was around April when, when someone, um, I have no idea who, but someone supposedly from within the government in Iran said that this is just Western propaganda and they're just trying to make us look bad. And since then, no one has, has really heard much about what the plans are and how it's going. Um, Beginning of 2012, we started seeing more use of DPAC inspection in Kazakhstan for some reason. I can't imagine they might, may, so maybe they just want to block Skype and they just happen to get Tor for free with whatever device they're using. Um, Ethiopia started blocking Skype and then they just also got Tor for free. Um, the interesting thing about Ethiopia is that, so we have around 300 users in Ethiopia. If you look at the metrics graph, metrics.torproject.org, if you look at the user graph for Tor users in Ethiopia, you will see the graph drop a couple of months ago from around 300 users to zero. If you look at the same graph for September last year, you see the same drop, but no one emailed us. So they were testing someone, like they were testing their Tor filter or Skype filter for about a week in September last year, and we had no idea because we need to have these people email us and contact us somehow and let us know that this is going on. Um, if, if you dig even further, you will see that Ethiopia, like Ethio Telecom, signed like a million dollar deal with the Chinese telecom company in July last year, a couple of months before Tor was blocked the first time. Um, so whether or not it is actually Chinese, I guess, devices being used to do this, I don't know, but it kind of seems likely. Um, United Arab Emirates, uh, one, just one of the ISPs, started using DPAC inspection to block tour a couple of months ago. Um, I recently heard there might be something similar in the Philippines and in Oman as well. So the use of DPAC inspection is, is, is spreading. Uh, people are kind of now learning that this is the one tool that will actually block everything and there's no way to get around it. Well, there is for tour, but. Uh, so one of the things that we did after the DigiNotar and Komodo incident was that we pinned the certificate for our website in Google Chrome. So that means that if the certificate that you see is different, is not matching ours, then you will not be allowed to access torproject.org. So in a normal scenario, when you browse to a website and Every now and then you will see Chrome will, will show you a warning saying, um, I can't trust this certificate, what do you want me to do? In most cases, you, there will be like a button saying proceed anyways, which gives the user the choice to just continue on even though the connection may not be secure. And a lot of users don't know what this means. They just see like a red side and like a button saying proceed and so they click it. Now that we've pinned the certificate, this is not happening. You will not be able to continue to the website in Google Chrome. Um, a problem that I just discovered with this if, is if you're using Windows XP prior to Service Pack 3, 
probably not as widespread anymore, but I've seen it happen, um, then you will have some issues with CHA 256 signed certificates, including the one for our site. Uh, our certificate is not pinned in, in, in other bra browsers, so it's, it's just for Chrome, which, so we kind of try to like encourage users who are really, really worried and who are in, um, I guess, war zones um, to use Chrome instead if they need to download our software. Because at least that way, the, you, you know that if you reach the website, you can at least be pretty sure that the connection is actually secure and you're getting the software you're supposed to get. Did you try to get Mozilla to uh, pin it? I don't know if we actually talked to them at that point. We may have. Like, I think we talked to like all the major browser they vendors. Because all those uh, blacklist certificates for the Diginota incident. So I thought it would be easy to pin Tor as well. Yeah, I, I can't remember why it wasn't pinned. Um, I can check. Um, but for now, it is it is just pinned in, in, in Chrome. I mean, it, it, it could be that we have better contacts at Google, for example, and that with Mozilla, we're just kind of waiting for it to reach the top. I don't know. Um, so normal tour cannot get around deep packet inspection. So Ops proxy is a way of obfuscating tour traffic so that it looks different, and different being whatever you want it to look like. Um, so this was a Google Summer of Code project um, where we kind of, we thought it would be able to, to circumvent deep packet inspection boxes. Um, so when Iran started using D DPI to block SSL in February 2012, we figured, well, now's a good time to rule this out. So like on Valentine's Day, when most people go on dates and have a great time, we all sat inside and rolled out this thing to help tons of people in Iran. Um, and it worked. With this, this special new version of Tor, you can get around deep packet inspection boxes. So within probably a week, we had thousands of, pe of people were back online. Now the problem with this is well, one, it requires people to set up a special Tor server with this software, um, and users need to get a new special Tor uh, browser bundle with this software. So you can't just use your existing version. You have to go and download. So you actually have to get a hold of this software. And then if you can't get to the website, if you can't get anywhere, if you can't email us, then you do have a problem. Um, another issue was that Ops proxy at that point was still in development. We, pl we, we, we thought we had more time. The plan was to like spend the spring writing some documentation, testing it, making sure we could maintain it, um, and that everything would just work out great, and then we'll test it when we're ready. That didn't really happen. So we tested it in February. It worked great. And we then ran into the issue that we're already building a lot of packages. Now we have to build a ton more. Um, so we're kind of working on automating these builds so that we can again ship this uh, new Tor browser bundle and that everyone in countries where they are blocking Tor with D DPI can access it again. Um, we have some Google Summer Code projects now that are for developing, I guess, pluggable transports to make Tor traffic look different. So the way it is now, Tor traffic with uh, ops proxy will just kind of look like a blob of just like random blob of data. It doesn't look like Tor, and that's kind of the main thing right now. But then there's uh, Stegotaurus that will try to split uh, streams different ways and just make it so that it's not the same type of Tor traffic. It's just, it will just look completely different. For Like every time you open a new tab in your Tor browser bundle, the traffic that you end up sending out will look different. Um, Skype Morph, there's a paper. I'm not sure just how usable it is at this point, but it is something that we're working on to make Tor traffic look like Skype. With Skype being blocked with a lot of DPI boxes, I'm not sure how well that's going to work, but it would be an interesting uh, thing to try.
Yeah, so this is the graph from Iran when they blocked uh, all encrypted connections on Valentine's Day, and we then roll out our special <coughs> version a bit later. Uh, so people were back online and not too long, like a couple of weeks. So like I said, learning about a new incident where D DPI is being used to block Tor kind of requires someone to email us and say, hey, it's not working. We have a contact in the country who's technical enough to understand what we want to do if we get access to their servers so we can actually test things, then we do that. Um, in a lot of cases, the users aren't all that technical, so they will follow instructions to use Wireshark and get the data that we need to analyze. But, but when it comes to giving us access to their laptop, then that's a different case. Um, so kind of we're kind of just waiting for people to let us know that it's not working. And then one thing we did in the case with Ethiopia, because we didn't know anyone technical enough to give us access to their machine inside the country, we found uh, their IP space isn't all that big. So we found one IP address that, for a host that seemed to be up and running. And we started sending random packets to it. And then we saw which ones were dropped by the firewall. Um, and so it, 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 it seems they're blocking both the client hello and the server thing, but it's, we're not entirely sure. They seem to do, like the firewall seems to do a bit of random stuff, depending on the size of the packet you send. Um, so that is still, we're not entirely sure. We know that uh, ops proxy will get around it. But since that is currently not maintained and we're working on that, then these users are, as of right now, um, not easily able to connect. But what we do is that when we, tr like when we think we've managed to identify the fingerprint, then we set up uh, special bridges that we give out to these people. So in the case of Ethiopia, um, the solution was to set up a bridge that does some interesting things to like the traffic like the, the streams in addition to to choosing a specific cypher suit so you kind of just have to modify like the server component and then just ask the user to try and just hope it works um, and that's worked in Ethiopia I'm not sure about Kazakhstan or other countries and it's something that we kind of need to test we need to just keep emailing people and keep looking for contacts who can help us test these things So on metrics.torproject.org, we have um, a lot of graphs for like number of users in different countries. We also have um, one one graph that tries to identify censorship events either by like a spike in users, like during the time of the Vatican leaks. I think that was July or end end of June. Someone like in the Vatican decided to to leak some documents and, and the number of toy users went from like four to like 15, I think. So you see a massive spike on the graph. Um, and it also tries to identify when, when Tor is being completely blocked. Um, so what we've done now is that we have um, a mailing list that will then email you when there are massive spikes or massive drops so that you are notified. And at that point, you can either see if you've heard from any of these people, if they ha have emailed the support desk or anything like that, or you ask on Twitter if anyone knows anyone, or if anyone can help you out, or if anyone can test this from inside Dubai, for example. Then we also created the censorship wiki with uh, details about all these different blocking events. We try to uh, list as much data as possible that we have, just not the Wireshark captures. If you want to look at the, uh, the captured data, then uh, drop me an email and I might be able to, to send it over. It is somewhat, it can be sensitive depending on how much browsing the user has done while capturing the data and so on. Um, so that's, that's why we don't just publish that online. Um, but everything else that we have that we can publish is on the wiki. And there's Uniprobe <coughs> is, um, I guess we can call it a framework. It's a part of the Open Observatory of Network Interference Project. Uh, so who's heard about Herdict here? 
one. So Herdict is uh, a browser plugin that you can use to report if the website you're trying to visit is blocked. So if you go to Facebook, you find that it's blocked, you can click this button and it will send this information back to the OpenNet initiative and they will create this big list of websites that are blocked in different countries. The problem with this is that there is no good way for them to actually check that this information is correct. Uh, in some cases, you might see that Facebook is blocked in the U.S. because Facebook had just happened to be down or their school blocked Facebook. And so people click this button and report that Facebook is blocked. Um, so Uniprobe and this OONI project is the goal is to kind of collect high quality data from these users directly. So the idea is that you download this tool and then you run a series of tests and then you submit that back to us. Um, we have been working on a more automatic way to use this tool to determine how different devices are blocking toward what the fingerprint is. So you'll have a client component and a server component and they will just run a series of tests and try to narrow down the list of possibilities. What is the danger to your users? I imagine if some people try to use this in Iran, they might get visitors very soon, very fast. Yeah, and that's, so there's a lot of different types of tests. Um, there was, so the people behind Uniprobe gave a talk in, I guess, Seattle. Uh, uh, and Jake, right? Have you seen the talk or read the paper? I've read the paper, the draft, and uh, yeah. Yeah, it's so I think they... I Actually, we, we developed for Uni. Prosper is going to be a plugin in Uni. Okay, cool. So I know a bit about it. Yeah, yeah so, so I believe... I, I haven't read the paper, but I believe that they went from... The initial idea was that people download this tool, uh, and then you connect and you run the tests, and you pull the data. But now it's more up to the user what kind of tests the user actually want to allow. But then, yeah, if the user is some just some, some really, really enthusiastic 12-year-old who has no idea what he's doing, but he runs all these tests and sends it back to us, even though it is sent over to her, then, yeah. And doesn't so... It doesn't matter really much if he's uh, trying it from DSL connection of his parents' place and he, let's say, accessing Twitter from inside Iran is enough to put you on a list, I guess. Might be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, using VPN is illegal in Iran. I haven't heard of anyone actually getting into trouble for doing that, but then it might still happen. So, so, so yeah, there is a lot. Um, ev even with certificates and choosing to click the proceed button on, on, on the website, there's a lot about kind of letting the user know exactly what you're going to do and, and, and how sensitive you believe that information is, and then let them make that choice. But yeah, it's a it's a it's a tricky question, um, and that was my slides. So if anyone has more questions or questions about other things about tour, now's your chance. Now's your chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, we talked a lot about sort of blocking, but you can imagine if you're sort of in an oppressive regime or whatever, maybe a bigger concern is being personally identified. So, you know, if there's instances um, recently in the paper, like they were trying to catch pedophiles maybe using the Tor network, and they used tricks by sort of, well, basically having slightly modified Tor relay nodes, which would actually use some tricks to actually identify the person outside of the network, that sort of thing. So, like, I mean, when you say things, you know, oh, it's good to use this because you can access your own websites or whatever. Is there any evidence that, you know, oppressive regimes might be using that sort of approach as well to actually say, okay, you're using Tor, now we know who you are. Now we're coming for you. Because that's much more scary than just saying, oh, now I can't access the network. Yeah. Um, I haven't heard about anyone running into pro any problems for using <coughs> Tor specifically. But I have heard about people being picked up because they did tons of other stuff and they happened to use Tor. So I don't think Tor itself was the trigger, but I don't think it helped either. There's a lot, like even, even in the UK and in the US and in Norway, there's a lot of talk about if you're encrypting your data, if you're using two-factor auth on Gmail, then, then, then you're a hacker. Like you're up to no good. You're an activist, like you're a whistleblower. Um, 
So yeah, it could be in some cases that, that using Tor might be enough to stand out, which is why we want more people to use Tor. If you're the only person within China, is it still working? I guess it is. <laughs> uh, if you're the only person within China using um, using Tor, then you'll stand out. If there are like 30,000 people in China using Tor, then But the difference not is so if the China deliberately says, go ahead, like, you know, puts a few things in which actually identify people. You know, it's actually, a, to it's actually, actually, an, it's actually an attack to try and find out who's using it. You know? Well, you can, that's, you so can easily identify who's using Tor, but you can't identify what they're using Tor for. Yeah, so yeah. that's the difference. When you're connecting to Tor, your ISP <laughs> or your network administrator or whatever can see that you're using Tor. <laughs> what you're using Tor for? That argument though about like, traffic is enough, or do you need to see the content? Yeah. So, yeah. And some of our Chinese master students said uh, the thing about the thing that makes filtering effective in China is not actually the Great Firewall. It's the fear of this, the police turning up at 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. having noticed you trying to circumvent the Great Firewall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that that does raise this general issue, which is that if some of the ways of attacking bad behavior, however we construe bad behavior, including the forms that we can all, as denizens of possibly non-repressive regimes, although that's arguable. Now, it's one of the things that came up in at the CSERB event in Brussels when we were talking about TOR, or at least no disconnect, Yeah. Um, which was that it was a bit rich for Europe to be going touting this stuff around the world because they were great champions of democracy, and they couldn't even make democracy work at home doing these sort of political things. But the point is that if you have a sample of traffic, and if it's a, a normal sample of traffic that people come to through the normal ways, then the proportion of people doing bad things is small, small enough that it may be infeasible or impractical to go after further information about those people. If you offer a form of traffic wherein they can be identified, but no further than that, that has a richer proportion of bad people in it, then it becomes cost effective to gather further information about those people. And therefore, if you get something, I mean, when I adopted PGP, it was just a kind of principled stand because it existed and because the overhead in using it was relatively low and just because I wanted to send some sort of symbolic message to anyone who might be watching. But if I wanted to do something bad, then I would certainly find this attractive. And so there is a distinction between the things that one group of people think are bad but another group of people don't, which is, let's say, repressive regimes or espionage or something like that, yeah. and things that everybody thinks are bad, you know, the child porn and so on, which creates the political will to validate this form of privacy intrusion based on a demonstrated act of using a privacy-friendly bit of software. And so there is a, a question about what you set in train by making this one. Yeah, I mean, the so the argument of we how bad people do bad things on the internet is it's we do hear that a lot, and I think it is a valid point to make. It is a valid concern, um, but then sure, if you're talking about child porn, it's a bit of a tough argument to make. But I think that if we start censoring Tor and deciding what users can and cannot do, then we have a broken tool. And then oh, no, no, you, no, no you, but on the other hand, like yeah. you know, we can't. We can't all of a sudden, like a U.S. nonprofit, tell people in Europe what they can and cannot do online with our tool. No, either. absolutely. So that's no, nor, nor should you. My concern was not with whether or not you yourselves were helping bad people to do bad things, but whether the knowledge, not just the perception, the knowledge that bad people were doing bad things with yeah. the aid of this, created a basis for things that would attack people who were using it for good and for bad purposes, and they all get caught. I mean, I'm not a pedophile, but if my activity is scrutinized because at that casual level, yeah. it cannot be distinguished from that of a pedophile, then I'm nonetheless coming under more scrutiny than I would do otherwise because of this association. Yeah. And it's not even a structured association. I mean, that's like the thing about the content versus traffic. You could certainly imagine if you were coordinating an event, like using BlackBerry Instant Messenger to coordinate a flash mob for some purpose, in which the pattern of communication, the, the topology of connection, is the message. There is no further message. You could be sending, hi, how are you? I'm sitting on the loo watching the Olympics. And it wouldn't matter. The fact that there was a message yeah. would mean, I know it, you know it, I know that you know it, and so we have enough. Because that was presumably the story about the Arab Spring. Not that many people were on social media. 
but the social media feeds were being relayed through Al Jazeera, yep. and it was common knowledge that everyone saw Al Jazeera, and so the threshold of my subjective probability that there would be other people there was high enough to get me out and yeah. get everyone out. That's a good point. Sure. More questions? Mm. <coughs> So Jonathan's questions really uh, just prompts me to, to think of two, two follows on from that. Uh, one is this, this very important point about theories of dissent and how dissent happens. Uh, there is this, this theory that it's just very important to have public signals that you are not alone. So in a sense, there's a critical mass of public opposition that has to occur. And uh, to some extent, a counterexample to this theory is provided by the protests in Iran around 2008, 2009 because there, there was very high level of visible protest, but the repression was so brutal that it did seem to be able to put that back in the box, despite the very high level of publicly acknowledged en engagement. So how much those theories of dissent work, I think, is still an open question. Uh, but the other point Jonathan made is um, this question of, of potentially subjecting oneself to greater surveillance because of using a technology which is known to have some level of abuse by bad actors. Uh, and that there is a very sharp um, legal uh, question hanging from this at the moment to do with the Council of Europe Cybercrime Treaty from 2001, because that cybercrime treaty contains provisions for streaming traffic data captured by law enforcement in one country in real time to another country. Uh, and it's not clear to what extent this has been implemented, but although that's been a sort of a question that they haven't paid much attention to for 10 years, there is a lot of attention now uh, at recent Council of Europe cybercrime conferences on this question of streaming transborder information for law enforcement in real time traffic data. Okay. So, if hypothetically one imagines that uh, you know uh, a bunch of fairly well resourced Western countries decided to capture and permanently log uh, tour exit mode traffic from their own jurisdictions where they're able to do that then unfortunately one of the problems with Tor architecture is with only like two, three thousand nodes, uh, once you're able to capture and log traffic uh, from you know, a substantial portion, more than 50% of nodes, you've got a damn good chance of de-identifying that traffic if you're simultaneously correlating that with watching traffic from a suspect that you want to confirm is actually using that system at that time and watching that website. Yes. So the possibility exists for, shall we say, uh, a coordinated detorification center to be built by Western law enforcement it's agencies. In Utah, surely. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the NSA's new data center. <laughs> yeah. Chris? Um, two things. The monthly reports, how, how far in, um, what's the delay on, on uh, publishing monthly reports? I looked at April, and I was looking for later, but I wasn't finding them. So we don't have anything know. later? Uh, not that I could see, but it may okay. be that I couldn't find my way. Um, so Andrew is the guy who, uh, he's the, Andrew Lumen, the executive director, who's got the great pleasure of creating those. Um, every, every single month now, contractors and employees will, we will email the tour reports mailing list right. with like a list of all the things that we have done that month. So if you want to follow the mailing, the mailing list, then you'll get the same information. And then Andrew, at some point, when he's got time, sits down and writes the summary that is the monthly report. Um, but I can I can check. I mean I think we put them on the blog every month. But if you haven't seen anything since I'm just looking on the monthly report April. archive. Maybe it's moved since since then to somewhere else. Okay, I can I can check. But the more detailed question I was going to ask is that I mean given that obviously there is a performance um, uh, degrade for using Tor, yep. um, is there a very you know, crude sense of method of just turning down the um, uh, the speed of traffic off by ISPs at government request that would have a serious impact on Tor. So not actually switching it off, but simply if you get it down to dial-up speed, I'm guessing Throttling SSL. Is, yeah. Right. It's what Iran's doing with the video. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and they did that with all SSL, so it happened with Tor, so Tor being slow and SSL being even slower in that combination. So in actual fact, one of the problems that could occur for Tor is simply not necessarily use of DPI in great depth, but simply if ISPs had knowledge about their heavy users, whether their heavy users are copyright infringers or developers or whatever they might be, simply turning them down would actually remove any 
or a lot of the, the kind of non-educational sites that, that people might be using to watch? Yeah, because if it's if it's too slow to use, so it is a, a bit slow now, but you get used to it kind of thing. But if it's too slow, like to the point where it's painful and you can't get anything done, then so yeah. I don't know how explicit the link to net neutrality is on this, uh, or know. the countries where you're targeting to, but there must be some. I don't know. It's a it's a good question, but yeah. That, that, that's raised a slightly more general issue. Just sure. for information, I've been trying to download Tor since the talk began. And um, thanks to being inside an Oxford system that insists on telling me with every referral that I'm inside an Oxford system and using the expired certificate so to do, um, I've got nowhere. I did get downloads that began and then sort of stopped. Okay. <laughs> but if you have classes of traffic that you can identify in some way, and it could be like what they did with peer-to-peer, -peer, right? Peer-to-peer, -peer, there was this prima facie view that it was bad stuff until iPlayer and so on began using the same protocols. So you could imagine drawing the sting or tilting the balance if Tor or tor label traffic were used for legitimate stroke essential purposes mm -hmm. and you got sort of large-scale users whose activity could not be easily constrained because it wouldn't be acceptable to do so because then you couldn't use that crude filter. Yeah. Now, whether it's a good idea to drive people into using more sophisticated filters, I don't know. But you can certainly imagine that that, well, you know, it's like racial prejudice, right? Only, only against bits. You use some sort of crude descriptor and you discriminate on that basis. And as Chris suggests, you can do the discrimination by some artful combination of latency and packet loss. Yeah. Or, or misdirection or drop connection, or, you know, any kind of thing. So interfering with the traffic will discourage or impair some kinds of use of the system more than others. Yeah. And so probably there's a really interesting cat and mouse or spy versus spy game. But then there's the law of the kind of the law of the few insight as to whether how many tour users do you need in a country before you have enough to to propagate. Yeah. Forty thousand around seems like a critical mass. Yeah. yeah. Any more? Yeah, I have one question. Um, all these attacks you explained on the Tor network were about deep <coughs> inspection and so on, and dropping some stuff, which is more like blacklistening protocols, blacklistening traffic. Um, would it be a very, let's say, sophisticated attack on the Tor network to just, okay, to just allow certain links outside the country just to Google and, I don't know, DNS servers? So that you cannot connect to the Tor network anymore. So is there a way to circumvent that? I mean, so very um, hard to take that. Well, so the first step for that would be to block our website. Why not? But then, if you can get to Gmail, then you can get the Tor browser bundle via email, mm -hmm. and you can use that. And when you st yeah, yeah, you have to still route the traffic outside the country. Yeah. And if it's that, it's blocked because you just whitelist some IPs which are allowed in that country, and all of them are blocked. Yeah. And it's yeah, that's that's like the halal in internet that Iran wants to build, where they have like whitelisted and blacklisted addresses, I guess. Um, so if you can't connect to a single server or a single relay, uh, but then what if I set up a private bridge? Like, are, like in, in this case, yeah. So I guess what in a whitelist, a second bridge. In I mean, your scenario, you would like, like by default blacklist everything and then whitelist the things that you know exactly, you'd yeah. you'd want. Yeah. Um, no one has done that yet, so we haven't looked at it. <laughs> okay. uh, but um, yeah, that is a good question because um, you would then need someone who's got an IP address in that whitelist to set up a bridge or forward the traffic. Which I guess. will make packet inspection much more easier because every traffic is routed to that particular IP address. Yep. Okay. We've got time for one last question for Runa or for Casper. I have one general one. Uh, I was wondering, and it's not a technical question, I can't ask a technical question. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask if there was any political pressure on the project that you were doing from either side. You said you had servers in Europe, you had servers in the US, you had servers in Japan. Yep. So I would assume that governments in Europe, US and Japan would be supportive of the project. Uh, the project received any criticism or any push from governmental side so to amend, change, disclose information. 
the servers in Japan are uh, Amazon Cloud servers. So I guess they fall under US. I don't really know. Um, I assume they do. Mine's so running in Ireland. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, as, as for the rest, um, every now and then we are contacted by, it's usually law enforcement that have seen, like they have stumbled upon some guy used tour and he's also done a whole lot of bad things that they know about and they want to know if we can trace his connections. Um, and it doesn't happen as, as often now. So I think these days we do have contacts in various countries. We have worked with, for example, the FBI in the US to, to explain to them what Tor is, what the challenges are for them when people do use Tor and how they can use Tor as well. Um, apart from that, then there's no, I think the whole fact that, you know, Tor came out of like the US Naval Research Lab, it was a government project for government communications to begin with, um, makes it a bit different. Um, but apart from that, then no, not nothing on Tor specifically. Oh, Is Google still blocking Tor, uh, or sort of not, not allowing queries through Tor? Partially. So, so Google has has made this shift from being super awesome to uh, being awesome, but not too friendly to anonymous users. So, if you sign up for a Gmail account, you need to give them a phone number, whether or not that's a throwaway phone or the payphone across the street, it doesn't really matter, but you have to give them a phone number. Um, they try to link more information about what you do online so that they can build a super database on you. Um, and then, like you said, in some cases, if you search with Tor on Google, it will block it and say, hey, sorry, you can't search. Um, but there are other sites that, that are more they're not as good as Google, let's say, but they work. You can still get the information you want, and you can do it over tour. So. Okay. Thank you, Buna. <laughs>